Welcome everybody to this week's Ask an Astronomer live stream. My name is Stefan. I'm here with Kat, and we are students at the um, PhD students at the Institute of Astronomy at the uh, University of Cambridge. And today we are here to answer all your questions about uh, life, the universe, and everything, um, science stuff, PhD stuff, um, whatever you want to know. Um, and maybe why, why don't we start by uh, you just tell us a bit about what you do, Kat, and what's the field on what you're working on. Sure. Um, so I'm in my second year of my PhD working on the effect of impacts by asteroids and comets and um, other sort of small bodies on um, terrestrial plants, so plants like our Earth. Um, so looking at how their atmospheres evolve in time and where their um, volatiles like water might have come from. Yeah. So for those of you who don't, who don't know the setup here, um, you could, we are just uh, going to be streaming here for one hour and you can ask us any questions either in the YouTube chat or on Slido. You'll see the link um, here on the, in the bottom right. Or um, you can also ask us questions on the Twitch uh, chat or the Periscope chat uh, on Twitter. Um, and yeah, while we are waiting for, your, for you to write the first questions, uh, why don't we discuss one of the questions from last time? Um, because we did it well. We're not exactly able to answer it in, in as much detail as we wanted, so uh, today we can go back to that one. And we were asked what draft plans there are in the solar system, and in particular we had a few, uh, we found a few, uh, Ceres, uh, Hamuramea, Eris, Makemake, and Pluto, mm -hmm. and we're not sure if there were more, so uh, Kate, you're going to tell us <laughs> if there were more? Yes, um, so first, before we can talk about what a dwarf planet is, we really want to understand what a, a planet is. Yeah. So according to the IAU, which is the big body that decides everything about astronomy, like what we call our stars and what we call our planets, uh, a planet has to satisfy sort of three basic criteria. So it needs to be big enough that it's spherical under its own gravity. So it's, it's so massive that it sort of forms into a sphere, like what you picture the planets you think of when you think of Earth or Mars or Venus look like. And um, so that's the first criteria. It also needs to um, have cleared its orbit. So, for example, it can be the only thing that goes around the sun at the same time, sort of in the same region of space. Um, and then it also needs to be going around a star. Um, and so there are sort of many planets in our solar system that do satisfy those constraints. So the planets you think of, Mercury out to Neptune, um, and for a while, it was thought that Pluto did too. Um, but it turns out that actually our solar system is far more interesting than we maybe thought it was a while ago. And so there's a whole load of other stuff out there. So we've got asteroids in the asteroid belt. We've got comets that come from out beyond Neptune and fly all the way into the inner solar system and then fly all the way back out again. Um, and then we've also got stuff that sits out beyond Neptune and doesn't come into the inner solar system. And that's kind of where Pluto which is one of these dwarf planets lies. And so what makes something a dwarf planet is when it kind of satisfies some of the constraints towards becoming a planet, but not all of them. Mm. So for Pluto, it's, it's typically that they are large enough to be spherical and they are dire in direct orbit of the sun. So they're not a moon, for example, but they're not big enough to make themselves spherical. So they tend to be sort of funky potato type shaped objects. Um, and so that's, um, I guess, what makes something a dwarf planet. Um, as to whether all of these dwarf planets that were named in the chat, so Eris, Pluto, um, Maki Maki, um, whether they are the only dwarf planets, we don't know yet. Um, the solar system is a really big place and we've not found everything that's in it yet. So there is almost certainly some more big stuff out beyond Neptune that we've just not happened to see through a telescope yet. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. So when you mentioned that they have to clear their orbit, um, I think like some there's, there's some asteroids like kind of flowing in the in the path of Jupiter, like behind or before uh, it. Like does it still count? Like Jupiter obviously still counts as a planet, um, yeah. right? So do they not count? Is this a special case, or is it just oh Jupiter so big, uh, it's fine? Um, so they're a kind of special case. So these sort of followers of Jupiter are called the Jupiter Trojans. And that's a sort of um, an interesting gravitational effect. So if you have 
two big bodies and one is orbiting the other. So Jupiter is orbiting our sun. You can imagine if you were sitting on Jupiter, all you'd feel would be the gravity from Jupiter. And because Jupiter is so massive, that would be quite unpleasant. Um, and if you were much nearer the sun, all you'd feel is the sun's gravity because gravity kind of gets weaker as you go further away from the object. Um, so that's why when you maybe see astronauts on the moon, they can jump really high. That's because the object is smaller. Um, so bigger things have stronger gravity and the further you get from a thing, the weaker the gravitational force is. And so you can imagine if you're going along the line between Jupiter and the sun, at a point closer to Jupiter than the sun, but not on the surface of Jupiter, you get to a point where the gravitational attraction from the sun, even though it's much bigger, it's much further away, would be equal to the gravitational attraction from Jupiter, which is smaller, but you're closer to it. And so that's sort of one, what we call Lagrange points, which is essentially where there's no net um, gravitational attraction to you. So if you put something there, it will stay there. Um, and that's one of them. There's also another one um, where there's actually, there's quite a few. There's one the other side of the sun, there's one the other side of Jupiter, and then there's two, which is the ones that are interesting here, sort of following and sort of trailing and following Jupiter. So as Jupiter goes around the sun, these points where there's essentially no net gravitational attraction, sort of they move around the sun with Jupiter. And so if you put something there, it's going to stay there unless it sort of collides with something else and gets kicked out. Um, and so these sort of regions we call uh, very imaginatively L4 and L5 um, <laughs> because they're the Grunge points four and five. Um, and these are, the bigger your objects are, so your sort of your planet and your star, the bigger these spaces where you can put stuff and they'll stay there, um, the bigger they are. And so for Jupiter, so Earth has the Grunge points as well, but they're quite small. And so it's very, if you put something there, it's very easy to knock that thing out of there. And mm. so it won't stay there very long. Whereas for Jupiter, these things are much bigger. And so Jupiter, at some point in the past, when there was a lot of stuff flying around in our solar system, some of it ended up sort of in those points and has just stayed there forever. And so they follow Jupiter nicely around the sun, some in front of it, some behind it. Um, but they're kind of a special case because they're not, they're not there because Jupiter isn't big enough to get them out. They're actually there because Jupiter is so big that it sort of has attracted them. Ah, okay, yeah, that's, so it's actually probably confirming him as, 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 as well, it as a planet, uh, as opposed to, um, well, the, endangering its status, so it doesn't have to fear about being demoted like Pluto was. Um, okay. If Jupiter's not a planet, we're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I, maybe I'll tell you about a bit what, what I'm doing, because I, I usually don't get to do that, but <laughs> we're getting lots of questions. Uh, while I'm doing that, feel free to just ask anything uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, ask us about astronomy, about what we're doing, whatever you want to ever wanted to know. Now we can have the opportunity to ask us. Ask us. Um, so I'm working on cosmology, which is kind of uh, the study of how the universe evolved, how it how it began and expanded, and what it's going to do, and in particular what it's made up of. So, uh, for example, um, most of the universe is made up only to about five percent of the normal matter that we know, and to the other. 25 or 70 percent it's made of dark matter and dark energy which are um, components of the universe which we know very very little about so for example dark matter is where well, we know it's some kind of matter but we can't see it it's basically invisible and well that's about all we know we know a lot of things that it can't be so there are lots of ideas what it could be and they're all excluded so uh, yeah we know what it cannot be but um, we don't really have an idea we don't know what it exactly it is um, and it's even worse for dark energy. It's, that's like a, a mysterious force that makes the universe expand faster and faster, so you could say. So we know it must be some kind of energy because it makes the expansion go faster, but we don't know where it comes from, what it is. I mean, we, I mean it could be just kind of a, a mathematical thing, right? It could just be a, a feature of our universe, but it would be kind of very unnatural or it's very unusual for this to be this way. And we think it, it might be some some cosmological like something some fluid um, that we didn't find yet and uh, yeah we are we are working on this we're building a very precise measurement experiments so for example we just talked about those like branch points 
Um, in one of those Lagrange points, although not at Jupiter, but at Earth, so um, actually I think it's in, I'm actually not sure in which one it is, uh, the Planck satellite, it's um, it's in I think one of the Lagrange points around, well it was in one of the Lagrange points close to Earth, and mapped the cosmic microwave background. So that's, when you look out in the universe and look past all the stars and look at the microwave radiation, you actually can see something that comes directly from the Big Bang. So the Big Bang was about 13.8 billion years ago, that was kind of when the universe began, and it was a big kind of explosion, you can think of it. And the universe just was a big fireball that emitted lots of radiation. And this radiation traveled through the universe until today, and today we can see it, um, which is a really good source to find out what a, how, was the universe, how the universe was like a few thousand years after, the, after its beginning. Um, we just got our first questions. Uh, so thank you, Devin, for the question. Um, or oh, Ed, yeah, right. Um, what's the chance of there being aliens in space? Oh, that's a good question. Do you want to do you want to discuss aliens or should I? Ah, oh, I'll give it a shot. Feel free to share it. Right. So I guess the, the very short answer is we don't know, but we're looking. And um, the longer answer is sort of that depends on how special we think Earth is. And so when we ask how special do we think Earth is, we want to know how special is our star, the sun? Sort of is there something unique about the way that our solar system formed perhaps that made Earth sort of a very rare thing? So there's there's lots of things about Earth and our, our solar system that make sort of our planet habitable for us. So there's the fact that we're at the, the point at the sun where we can get liquid water on our surface, which we think is really important for life. We also, we have Jupiter in our solar system and Jupiter does a really, really good job of protecting the Earth from being hit by asteroids and comets and other sort of big things floating around in the solar system that could do quite a lot of damage if they were to hit Earth. And Jupiter does a really good job by being sort of big and a bit further out from the sun from us as sort of shielding us from all of those objects and sort of maybe that's really important. I, I guess um, we should also say like why we're discussing about uh, like why Earth would be important, like special at all. Uh, so I mean we know Earth is a planet that has life on it, I mean humans, um, and we found actually lots of other planets. So we found about 4,000 other planets like other than Earth uh, until now, well eight of them are in our solar system uh, including Earth and uh, about a few thousand other ones are out on, about, around other stars. So one example you see actually on the slide here is a TRAPPIST system, which has, um, or TRAPPIST, I actually don't know what's the pronunciation, um, seven planets, and there are also some with more or less planets. And there are like loads of planets in the universe, and there are like lots and lots more than we, than we already have found. Like we think there are billions of, billions of planets in the universe. And now the, the question to like, is there other life is, well, if life is something that's normal, like if Earth is not an exception, then we would expect that lots of life in the universe. You would expect like many of those planets to have life as well. But it could also be that there is something special that has to happen, like something that only happens really rarely and that it happened on Earth but nowhere else. And that would, in, in that case, we would be the only life. And then there's a question uh, why Earth would be kind of, why would it be special? I mean, one thing you mentioned, right, you need water to have life, at least we think. So that excludes already a big part of the planets, but not all of them. And then you can look for, for more and more things uh, that yeah, actually I don't know that much about. So maybe do you want to t tell me more about that? Yeah, so so as Stefan said, we found loads and loads of planets. But the problem is when we look for planets, the planets that are really easy to see are the planets that we know are going to be really, really horrible for life. <laughs> so we're good at finding planets that are really, really close to their star. And we're good at finding planets that are really, really big. And both of those things tend to make planets not like the Earth and therefore not like how we think that sort of habitable planets need to be. Um, so hopefully with some big telescopes that will launch sometime in the next 10 years, we will get better at looking for these kind of Earth-like planets. And also, fingers crossed, we'll be able to look at the atmospheres of these Earth-like planets. So that's really important because if we can see the gases that are in the atmosphere of a planet, we can begin to make guesses about what's going on on the surface of that planet. Um, so for example, Venus and Mars look sort of compared to Jupiter quite a lot like Earth. 
Mm. But we know that both of them are very unpleasant places to be without a spacesuit. And so, yeah, we, we really want to be able to get as much information as we can about our planets um, before we can say whether or not there might be any life on them. Okay. And we got uh, one, I guess, cosmology question uh, from YouTube. Um, is the universe open or closed? And maybe I should give a bit of introduction to this. So what general, what Einstein's theory of relativity told us is that the space in the universe, like kind of the, the space that everything exists in, could actually be curved instead of flat. So what you can imagine, imagine you are like an, an ant and you're living on a big sheet of, sheet of paper. You can like go left, you can go right, you can build something. It's just kind of your normal space. And then um, what you could also Imagine you're an ant and you're living on a big air balloon. So you could also, at first it would look kind of similar, right? You could just still, still have your surface and maybe build a an, build an house or something. But then if you just go very long in one direction, you would come around this balloon and appear from the other direction at the same place where you started. And this is something that can, can happen, well, it could happen in our universe as well. So if our universe was closed, that's kind of the mathematical word for something being kind of going around, Uh, you could take a spaceship, fly really long in one direction, and then kind of appear from the other di direction. Um, and open is kind of the opposite, where it's it's not closed, but it's also curved in the other way. So it's a bit like um, like like a saddle formed. So it's it's kind of curved, but it, it doesn't doesn't go back to itself. Um, and we're trying to to find this out. So we're trying to measure. Oh, what are the one way to find this out is really cool. And basically what you can do is you can draw a, a triangle. So you go into space, maybe you put three satellites into space and measure the dis distances and the angles exactly. And when you have a, a triangle in, uh, I can't take a tri triangle like this uh, <laughs> in space um, and you measure all the angles, if the space is flat, if you make it on the, on the flat piece of paper, then the angles will add up to 180 degrees. But if you make it on an air balloon or on like otherwise curved surface, the angles will not add up to the right, right um, number. So that's how you could, for example, find out even if you can't see like the other dimension if something is curved or not. And currently, it looks like so that's not the only test, right? So there, are, there are various various other tests. I won't go into details now. Um, but currently, it looks like the universe is flat, although it's not. We didn't, of course, not exclude it uh, that it's opened or closed. We can just say. At least it's this flat. So we're, we're quite sure it's quite flat. Like the curvature is a kind of a, a parameter that we use is 0.00 something. But we don't know if it's maybe 0.0001 or minus 0.0001. Actually, there was some debate about whether it's, it's close or not. I think the consensus is still that it's probably flat. Um, but there are some hints that it actually might be closed or that there might be something wrong with our measurements uh, if, it's, if it's not. Um, Yeah, we got a question from, from Periscope. Uh, thank you, uh, X Abyss. Um, can the wind be well incorporated in the standard model, uh, standard particle model? So if so, does it break SUSY or CPT? Um, so yeah, this is a question about dark matter. So I mentioned before that there is this stuff that's called dark, well, it's called dark matter. It's, it's some matter that is invisible, which is why we call it dark matter. And we are trying to find out what it is. And one really popular idea of what it is, is the so-called uh, VIN particle, which stands for um, weakly interacting massive particle. So the idea is, okay, it's, um, okay, well, let me let me take a bit of a, a wider approach here. So everything we know of is made of tiny particles. So first of all, like everything you see in this picture, um, like my hands, the, the wardrobe, um, is made up of um, atoms. And these atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then those protons and neutrons are split up into smaller particles again. So that's what we call quarks. And that's what we currently think are kind of the building blocks of our, of our universe. Those are the so-called kind of elementary particles. And now you could just think, okay, maybe this dark matter is just another elementary particle. Just add one to the collection. We already have, I don't know, a 12 or so, or actually well, a, bit, a bit more depending on how you count. Um, elementary particles, so you might as well add one more. Um, and one idea was, okay, make it a really heavy uh, one and make it weakly interacting. Weakly interacting so that it's, um, so that explains why you can't see it right now, because if it wouldn't be weakly interacting, well, it would, for example, scatter light and we could see it. And um, it needs to be heavy in order to still kind of work with 
with uh, cosmology. So there are some, some problems you get if you make this particle too light that I won't discuss in, in details now. Unless, like, if you're interested, I can tell you more about that. Um, but now to the question. Um, so if you can incorporate this nicely into the standard model, or if it, what it would do to other theories. So SUSY is a different th theory that is a theory of supersymmetry. And it predicts that actually there's not only the particles we know, but double the amount of particles. And the second half is kind of invisible, so it could be dark matter. And actually, um, Vim does work very well with, for example, the SUSY model um, extension of the standard model, and with also with other mo extensions of the standard model. And for example, in the SUSY case, the WIMP particle would be the heaviest of the <laughs> SUSY particles. So, but heaviest, I'm not sure, lightest. I think lightest, yeah. So all the SUSY particles would decay always into their kind of, into the lightest of the ones that they have. So, um, yeah, whatever that particle would be. And this particle could then be uh, the dark matter particle, the WIMP. Um, so yeah, that works quite well, but all our searches for these particles have not found any hints yet. So we have lots of searches like big tanks of, of liquid gas that are standing somewhere underground and waiting for signals. We're looking into the sky and searching for signals, for example, from rooms that collide with each other. And yeah, we have nothing, nothing yet. So um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it could be well in incorporated, but that doesn't doesn't help you. Well, I mean, it's, it's nice that you could incorporate it, but we didn't find it yet, and it might not be true. So it doesn't really help you that it's it works nicely. Um, I think there's a question for you again. Do we see yes. weather on Mars as we do on Earth, like tornadoes? Uh, thanks, yes. Jack, for the question. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic question. Um, so this is this is really exciting. Um, we do. So I guess quick bit of background. Mars is a little bit further from the Sun than Earth, um, and it's quite a bit smaller than the Earth. Um, and so when you look at Mars, it looks kind of red, and um, that's what's called the red planet, and that's because it's covered in sort of a whole load of slightly rusty dust um, and because Mars is quite a bit smaller than Earth um, or we think because it's smaller than Earth it has a smaller atmosphere than Earth so when we get weather that's kind of how we describe our atmosphere moving about and doing stuff so picking up water from the ground and dumping it on top of us and <laughs> sort of so what we talk about when we talk about weather is sort of movement of the atmosphere um, and so that's that's something that happens on Mars as well. Um, and so we get, because Mars is so dusty, um, it gets dust storms. So you get sort of things a bit like tornadoes and um, just like whirling sort of things of dust. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the Martian movie, um, but that features in, in that as a, a plot point. Um, but another interesting thing about weather on Mars is that because Mars's atmosphere is much thinner than ours, and because it's further from the sun, um, it has much more extreme temperature variations and it gets a lot colder than it does on Earth. Um, so it can get down to sort of minus very unpleasant temperatures. Um, <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Cool weather on Mars. Um, I, I think we also get a lot of interesting weather on other planets, right? So I heard about the like storms on Jupiter and Saturn being really exciting. Yes, yeah. So any any planet with an atmosphere can, in theory, have weather. So there's probably some really cool weather going on on Venus, but it's oh. very hard to see what's happening beneath the very top layer of the atmosphere on Venus. So we really don't know. But if you've ever seen a picture of Jupiter and seen the big red spot, which is a sort of red spot on the surface of Jupiter. Um, so if you picture Jupiter, um, it's got these sort of beautiful bands of different colors of brown going around it. And they're because, so Jupiter, we don't really know what's going on in the middle of Jupiter. It's a question that people are trying to answer. Um, but we know that the outside of Jupiter is just made up of um, a really, really thick layer of gas. Um, and so that gas is rotating around Jupiter, a bit like the atmosphere on Earth rotates around us and we get winds. But Jupiter is so big and its atmosphere is so big that there's sort of there's no such thing as a day on Jupiter because different bits of Jupiter rotate at different rates. So if you stood at the top of Jupiter, the time it would take, or if you could somehow float at the top of Jupiter, the time it would take you to go round Jupiter once is different from if you were at the sort of equator of Jupiter. 
So there's no such thing as a Jupiter day the way there is a day on Earth. Um, but the way we get those bands is because the different bits of the atmosphere are rotating at different rates. And so you end up with sort of bands that are going around together and then between the bands, because they're moving at different speeds, you get sort of cool turbulent effects. So if you ever zoom in on a picture of Jupiter, you can see sort of eddies at the, the points between the band. Um, and then, so there's also big storms, which is what the Great Red Spot is. So it's a giant hurricane and it's so big that you could put the earth in the center of the hurricane and the hurricane probably would not notice. Wow. Um, just for scale. Do, do we know at all if they're like, if Jupiter has any kind of surface at some point or is it still? So that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, so when the Juno mission went out to Jupiter a while ago and came back with, gave us lots and lots of wonderful data about what Jupiter is. One of the things it did is essentially mapped the gravity of Jupiter. So as it went past, it measured how strongly the satellite or the um, probe felt the pull of Jupiter. And some people can then do some very, very clever maths with all of that data to try and work out what that means for what the inside of Jupiter looks like. So is it sort of a, a rock in the center and then a sharp transition to this heavy gas atmosphere? Or is it more sort of gradual? You just get gradually less and less dense as you move out towards the surface. And it turns out that Jupiter has a really fuzzy core and we don't know why. Um, so there's some people think that maybe there was a big giant impact into Jupiter when it was quite young and that sort of disrupted whatever was in the center of Jupiter um, and sort of made it much fuzzier. So there's sort of, there's not a sharp defined boundary the way we might maybe expect them to be. Um, and so that's a really interesting question in planetary science at the moment. Nice, mm -hmm. cool. Very, very nice question. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, hello to, hello to Becky on YouTube. Um, when you want to ask some question, uh, just go ahead in the, in the chat and, and send us any question you have. Um, we got a follow-up question on the Jupiter discussion uh, from, from Periscope, indeed. Um, what prevents gas giants much larger than Jupiter from undergoing fusion? Uh, maybe high metallicity? Ooh, well... I'm, I'm not sure. Are there, are there many um, uh, gas giants that are larger than Jupiter? Um, so there are a few. Um, this comes back to what do we mean by larger? Um, ah, yes. So we get Jupiters that are much closer to their, their host star than our Jupiter is. And we call those unimaginatively hot Jupiters because they are hotter. Um, and because they're hotter, they're puffier. So ah. they might be the same mass as Jupiter, but they can be much, much bigger in terms of radius. Um, but as you add more mass to something like a Jupiter, mm. um, it can get a bit bigger. But once it gets to kind of a few times uh, a Jupiter mass, you become what is called a brown dwarf. So this is something that's, it's not really a planet, but it's not quite a star yet either. And that's because, um, so stars, the definition of a star is something that is burning or sort of burning through its material by a process we call fusion, fusion which is where you take sort of two light uh, nuclei. So in most stars, that's hydrogen and you fuse them together. And when you fuse them together, you get a helium molecule, which is sort of one thing bigger than hydrogen on the periodic table. And when you do that, you release some energy. And so that's what our sun is doing at the moment. It's fusing hydrogen into helium. Um, and then as stars get older and they run out of hydrogen, they can start fusing helium into heavier elements like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. And then as they get even bigger, if they're big enough, they can start fusing the heavier elements and so on and so on and so on. Um, but the step before they start fusing hydrogen, is something called deuterium, which is essentially kind of heavy hydrogen. Um, so a hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. Um, and if you have something that's just a little bit heavier than hydrogen, um, it turns out it's actually easier to fuse that. Uh -huh. So the, the fusion begins when you get to hot enough temperatures in the center of your star. Um, and so the bigger, as you grow something like a gas giant, as you add more and more mass to the outside, that squishes it down. And so the center gets denser and denser. And as it gets denser, it also gets hotter. And so 
if you reach what we call the hydrogen burning limit, then you start, you ignite hydrogen and you start fusing it into helium and you become a star. Um, and what happens in burned dwarfs is that they don't quite reach that limit, um, but they do reach the limit where they can start fusing deuterium. And so they can be kind of not quite stars, but also they're not planets either. Um, and so that's, I guess, what happens when you have gas giants that are much larger than Jupiter. If that answers okay. the question. So basically, you don't have enough density or in the center to, to start fusion at some, like with Jupiter and slightly bigger. And at some point, like a, a bit more, like, I don't know, if you, what I, how, whatever, I don't know the number. Uh, but if you go like a lot bigger than Jupiter, you can start deuterium fusion and then you get um, yeah, hydrogen fusion if you are even bigger. Um, does the metallicity do anything about that? Like, oh, um. we should say maybe what this is. Um, so yeah, we astronomers call, of course, uh, everything a metal that is not hydrogen and helium, because the universe is made up mostly of hydrogen and helium. Almost everything else is just uh, made in stars, so it, it wasn't there from the beginning, but it was produced over the lifetime of the universe. And astronomers tend to call this metals. And what we call metallicity is how many metals are in, in a star or in an object. Um, and I think in Jupiter, or in general, in like gas giants and stars, it's very little, like, um, I think almost all of the content of stars is still helium and hydrogen. Um, so I'm not sure if it, if it makes a big impact on like what they can fuse, or does it? Um, I, I don't think so. I think you need an awful lot of metals before you started running out of the things you actually fuse. But yeah. I'm not a person so, stars. So when you're like, when, when say half of your hydrogen is used up, maybe then, so then kind of fusion gets, gets harder, like depending on where your helium is. Uh, then you might like stop fusing hydrogen. But when you have 99% or 1% metals, that won't basically affect your, your fusion ability. Uh, what it does is it allows you to kind of collapse better into like smaller objects. So let's say you're a really hot ball of, ball of gas and you're not dense enough to form a star yet. But when you cool down, it, you collapse kind of to a bit smaller, smaller um, same mass um, bunch of gas, and then you might start fusion. And this kind of cooling process from a large hot object to a smaller colder object that is easier when you have metals so actually when you want to form stars it's easier to form stars from well if you have yeah forming stars from kind of balls of gas is easier when you have more metals when you have a higher metallicity um, okay we got uh, we got more questions one from Slido and um, do we know how the planets have come to be aligned as they are today uh, thank you for the question Jack um, I think Brilliant. that's all for you. <laughs> this is this is this is fun. Um, the answer is maybe. Um, so it turns out it's the history of our solar system is very interesting. Um, so you might look at it today and say that's a bit boring. Everything's going in circles around the sun. Um, and then occasionally you get a comet that comes in, and that's very exciting. And you all go outside and look at the comet. Um, but it turns out that in the past, our solar system was probably, I guess you could say, much more interesting. Um, so there's a lot more stuff flying around in the solar system. So what Stefan is showing in the slide on the screen now is um, something called a protoplanetary disk. And this is um, like a baby solar system. So when solar systems uh, like ours and like all the ones we see, in the universe we're forming and we think they form out of sort of disks of gas and dust that collapse down and sort of as they collapse down they form a star in the center and then a sort of because they're rotating you get a disk that spreads out and sort of that disk is full of gas and dust and because it's full of gas and dust sort of bits of dust can stick together and then you get sort of the gravity from those bigger lumps that attract more things. And we're not entirely sure how that works. It might be lots of small things, or it might be slightly bigger things coming together and sticking together. But somehow within there, you do form planets because we see planets. Um, and so you can end up forming sort of a series of planets within this gas disk. And because there's gas there, which essentially sort of buffers the system and makes it quite stable, you can end up with planets that are quite close together. And um, so almost in sort of chains, like peas in a pod. Um, but then eventually the sort of the star accretes more gas and the rest of the gas is blown out because our solar system today isn't full of gas. And so 
once all the gas goes away, you lose that kind of stabilizing effect of the gas on the planets. And we've never seen this happen, but we do, we can guess or we can infer from computer simulations of what we think might happen in those situations. And that's um, what we call an instability, which is essentially um, sort of things that were stable when there was gas suddenly are not stable. And so lots of interesting things can happen in our computer simulations, but most of them involve planets kind of jumping around all over the place. And sometimes they, you get collisions between two planets. Um, so we think that the way we got our moon was a collision of something about the size of Mars with Earth fairly early on in the, the history of the solar system. And that created sort of the Earth and the moon as we have them today. Um, but then that clearly didn't happen to Venus because Venus doesn't have its own moon like we do. Um, but you can, so you can have planets colliding together. You can also have planets kind of getting very close to each other and sort of slingshotting one of the planets out of the solar system. Um, so you can sort of just lose a planet. In, you don't know where it goes. It might end up on a sort of very eccentric orbit. Um, so we have some evidence of exoplanetary systems where there's sort of planets on very eccentric orbits and we think maybe that's because there was an instability earlier in the system. Um, so eccentric yeah. basically is, it's, it's not like in a nice circle, but it's a really, well, very, it's an ellipse and that's like very long. So it's kind of goes very far away from the sun and then comes back once in a while. Yeah. Okay. So in answer to your question, Jack, we can, we can make guesses, but um, we don't know for sure, and we're still trying to find out. Okay. Um, we got, I think, a follow-up question to the to the wind discussion um, about gas emissions uh, like SO two on lunar atmospheres. Atmospheres like uh, Jupiter Io, uh, Jupiter's moon, are used to map wind speeds. Um, do you, Do you know about that? Because I have I have no idea about this field. Um, gas emissions on lunar atmosphere is like Io. Okay, so Io is one of the moons of Jupiter. Um, and if you've ever seen a picture, it looks kind of moldy. Um, and that's because it's very volcanic. Um, so it's quite, it's, as moons go, it's very close to Jupiter. And that means as it goes around Jupiter, it gets squished and expanded and squished and expanded. Um, and so the center of Io, we think, is sort of slightly melted because it's been heated. Um, and so that makes it uh, essentially have volcanoes like we have on Earth, which spew kind of not very nice gases into the atmosphere. Um, I am not sure how you would use that to map wind speeds. Um, I don't know if that being done on Io, but I could very well be wrong. Um, um, do, do you know how we do with the wind speed? Like, how do we find out about the storms in general, like on other planets, like for example, Mars? How would we do, how would we do it there? Yeah. Um, so I guess it depends on how, whether or not you can get a rover to your surface. Ah. <laughs> okay. So we're spoiled on Mars because we have loads of rovers on Mars, um, that are packed with very exciting instruments that can tell us lots about what's going on the surface and um, sort of in different places on the surface. Um, so obviously on Earth, we measure wind speeds using the sort of the whirly gig things you see on weather stations. Um, we can't do that on most planets. So quite often we have to kind of look at the atmosphere and guess. Um, so we can take observations um, of sort of how the atmosphere is emitting radiation and how it might be absorbing radiation. Um, and so basically looking kind of at the, at the cloud, is there any and then or like what well, whatever gases they have, like if they're not kind of invisible. I mean, yeah, on, on Mars, I think it would be kind of, well, could you do this on Mars because you don't have anything that you can see in the atmosphere or is it just, well, can we see it? It's just hard to see. Um, so I think, I mean, we can't see it, but I think some of the, the spacecraft that orbit Mars, um, so they're, they're way out in space going around Mars. Um, and I think they might maybe be okay. able to, to see more about what's going on with the gas. Um, this is pushing my my knowledge <laughs> of Mars to its absolute limits. Okay, so um, we got again a cosmology question. So that's that's for me. Uh, thanks to, to um, XLS from Telescope again. Uh, can vacuum energy density 
Can an expanding universe be the only reason why we have flat um, SP? I'm not sure what that's meaning. What that is, uh, and dark energy. Um, okay, so that's that's combining two um, two fields of of uh, physics that are quite interesting and that don't agree by a big amount. And so in quantum physics, you have this uh, this thing called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And basically, what it says is it allows you to create particles from nothing by kind of borrowing a bit of energy from the universe as long as you pay it back correctly. So that's what we call vacuum fluctuations. So what happens, ah, space time, right, um, is you have kind of a vacuum, let's say you're somewhere in space, and then suddenly an electron and an anti-electron appear. And then they collide, annihilate, and disappear again. And the universe is fine with that. Um, as long as you kind of take only a little bit of energy, so only like one or like a few particles, and uh, give them, like, they disappear again quickly. And these vacuum fluctuations should, in theory, the complication is quite complicated, but our calculations give us some result, uh, how much they should contribute to the kind of energy density of the universe. So they should affect how the universe expands and um, how, it, how it behaves, like, over the billion years. Um, and on the other hand, we can measure how the universe expands and how it accelerates. So what you would think is if the universe grows, and then you have this kind of vacuum fluctuations that happen everywhere. So if the universe grows, you get more of them. So they have a bigger effect, so it grows faster. So that you get even more of those fluctuations, so the universe grows faster and faster. This is this accelerated expansion, what we what I just before called dark energy. And these vacuum fluctuations, fluctuations would have been a really wonderful explanation for why this is happening. The problem is that these vacuum fluctuations are about 120 orders of magnitude larger than um, the value of, of this expansion. So the expansion is far too slow for it to be caused by these vacuum um, fluctuations. And either this particle physics calculation or, or measurements are totally wrong. And what of course what could be is that these uh, calculations are correct and this is a different effect cancelling out exactly this contribution. But of course, that would be quite a coincidence, and it would be really um, surprising to see this. So, uh, yeah, that's why vacuum uh, like vacuum fluctuations don't don't work out to explain the expansion of the universe, the accelerated expansion, because just the numbers don't match at all. Um, although it does help you with um, the flatness of the universe, so whether any expansion does. Well, not, not really those vacuum uh, fluctuations, but mostly the ones that happened at the very beginning of the universe. So when the universe was only a fraction of a second old, we had the phase called inflation. So what happened is the universe was, well, really small by the standards and expanded ridiculously fast uh, to a ridiculously wide, um, large, large universe, kind of. And um, during this really fast expansion, um, imagine again our kind of air balloon, right? If your, if your universe was curved, like an air balloon, and then you blow it up by a huge factor, like make it a hundred million times larger, then suddenly, if you look from, from the outside, it looks quite flat. And that's um, what would happen with the universe as well. So, the reason, you would expect that the universe is quite flat, given that it expanded so much during its history. Um, so yeah, that, that's indeed an expansion, and a reason for the, for the flatness, you could say. Um, I see we got a new YouTube question. Um, is a black hole spherical or is it an actual hole? Ah, um, do you want to talk about black holes or should I? Ah, I'll leave that one to you. Okay. Um, so a black hole is a, a name that we what we gave to a, a certain object. And in particular, the, this object is something that's so heavy, so a, a very kind of small and heavy object. And the, the special thing is, so let me, let me, <laughs> go a step backwards. Um, when you, the relativity theory of Einstein tells you that mass curves this kind of space, the space and, and time that it's uh, surrounding. So, for example, the Earth makes um, time goes slower on its surface, and it makes light that goes around the Earth kind of change its path, uh, path slightly. And these effects get much stronger if you have more and more mass. And in particular, when you put a lot of mass in a small small point. That the gravity is so strong at this point and it curves space-time so much that nothing can escape from this point. So when you would throw up a stone, it will fall down immediately. Even if you shoot up light out of a black hole, it doesn't escape because it's it's just too strong, the gravity. And 
Um, this is why it's called a black hole. So it's just, if you would look at it, it would just look black because no light would escape from it. So um, there's nothing nothing to see, right? If it, even if there would be something inside that's burning or in any, any other way emitting light, this light couldn't escape. And it is, well, we don't know what it looks inside, right? It could be kind of a point. It could be kind of a clump of matter. It's probably spherical because, well, we know all the heavy things are basically spherical because they kind of gravity would crush it kind of into a sphere. Like if you would have an X-shaped black hole, the gravity at the at the long, like far away points would be stronger and then it would kind of squash itself into a sphere. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's not, so the word hole come, kind of comes from the idea of that it curves space-time and then you could, you know, you might know these drawings of kind of space-time as, as a sheet where then a, a, um, a dip like corresponds to a massive object but in in reality it's kind of a, a three-dimensional object so it's kind of a, a sphere it's really a sphere and if you would take a pick, look you would just see a black sphere uh, of this black hole um, let me show you an actual picture of a black hole uh, so yeah this one is an actual picture let me move the chat a bit um, this is a black hole in the galaxy m87 that we have photographed i think last year uh, with a lot of radio telescopes, so we took a lot of radio telescopes around Earth, combined them all to make one really great picture. And well, it doesn't look that great, but for our, <laughs> for com like, um, comparing it with other photographs of this object, it's really great and detailed. So what you can see there in the middle, that is the black hole in the center of this galaxy, and around that you see some kind of hot gases basically around the, the black hole, I think. And yeah, this this kind of shadow in the middle, there is. Um, the black hole and no light comes out of there because there's just, well, no light can come out of a black hole. Um, here's a simulation of a black hole that's kind of, well, if you would could take a really nice picture of a really nice black hole in front of the Milky Way, um, then it would look something like this, so a bit clearer. Uh, you see, again, you have this kind of black uh, sphere in the middle where no light comes out. And then around you see these kind of distortions. This is because light from behind the black hole goes close to the black hole then goes a few times around the black hole and then comes to your eyes. So that's why everything close to the black hole is messed up by this by its gravity. So black holes are really fascinating objects. Um, we got a, a question uh, again from YouTube. Thank, thank you for the questions. Um, what is a shooting star? Uh, Kat, that's one for you. Yes, this is, this is my thing. Um, so a shooting star, if you've ever seen one in the sky, it looks like a sort of a star that's moving across the sky really quickly. Um, and so that's a big hint that it's not a star. <laughs> um, so when we look up at the night sky, we see essentially the star is fixed in place. Um, that's not really true, sort of as the Earth goes around the sun, the stars look like they move. Um, but that's something you see over the time scale of maybe a year. Um, whereas a shooting star is very clearly moving across the sky in seconds. And it tends to appear and then disappear. And so we call them shooting stars because they're bright, shiny objects in the sky. Um, but what they actually are is rocks from space that have come and hit the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so you, yeah, you might maybe think that, apart from all the planets, the solar system is pretty empty. Um, that's not true. It's full of stuff. Um, so we've got asteroids in the asteroid belt. They are occasionally sort of colliding with each other and when they collide with each other they break up and they produce sort of um what sort of yes lots of smaller objects and some dust and some of that ends up getting kicked out the asteroid belt and so it maybe ends up slightly closer to where earth is um and sort of the general rule with objects in space is you have very few of the largest objects and as you get smaller and smaller you get sort of more and more objects of that size so there's only one Jupiter-sized thing in our solar system, but there's sort of lots of, there are a few sort of Earth-sized planets, and then there's lots of asteroid-sized objects, which are maybe tens to hundreds of kilometers in size. And by the time you get down to things that we would think of as rocks, so sort of maybe a big boulder a meter across, there's thousands of them. Um, and so occasionally they come when they hit the Earth. Um, the other thing about space is that stuff is moving really fast. Um, so we don't notice it because we're on the Earth, but the Earth is moving around the sun at sort of hundreds of kilometers um, an hour, sort of really, really fast. And we don't notice because there's not much in space for us to hit, but it means that when a rock sort of does 
across the Earth's path and ends up sort of reaching our atmosphere, the difference in speed between the Earth and that rock can be really quite high. Um, and what that means is that as the rock sort of passes through our atmosphere, compared to space, the top of our atmosphere is quite dense. And as you get further down the atmosphere, the atmosphere gets denser and denser until you get to sort of what we're sitting in now. And we might not think that sort of the air has much resistance, but if you've ever been cycling and cycling into a headwind, that can feel really hard. Um, and that's air resistance. And so when a rock is coming in from outer space, it experiences an awful lot of air resistance. Um, and what that does is it heats it up. Um, and so for most things, bar the asteroid that hit when the dinosaurs were around, sort of that heating as it passes through the atmosphere, the objects are small enough that that essentially sort of blows them up. Um, and so you get rocks that are essentially on fire, sort of streaming through our atmosphere. And that's what we see as a shooting star. Um, and occasionally they're big enough when they enter the atmosphere that they're not completely destroyed by the time they pass all the way through the atmosphere. And so sometimes they make it all the way to Earth. And that's what we call a meteorite. Um, so that's a rock that came from space. Um, and was big enough to survive and land on the ground solid. But most of them um, sort of die at the meteor stage. So they just burn up in the atmosphere and they look very pretty for a second or two and then hmm. they're gone forever. Okay. So they seem to be a bit like kind of similar, like from, from kind of the speed they're going through the sky, well, probably a bit faster than satellites, but kind of like similar, like kind of a relatively bright, bright spot that's moving relatively quickly uh, through the sky. I think then, then like the big difference is a satellite doesn't like it, it's not on fire, right? It's just the sun shining on the satellite and it reflecting on Earth, while where those rocks are literally on fire and do indeed have their own light. So that's what, probably why they're also quite bright. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really cool, yeah. And we got a question from from Periscope about a uh, light pollution, I suppose. Uh, so maybe we can explain this a bit. Um, years ago, where I live was it was ru rural, so you could see thousands of stars and even colors. And now it has become industrialized, so you can't uh, barely can see stars at all. Um, yeah, do you want to say a bit about this and why it's harder to see stars when it's kind of light around you compared to when it's really dark? Yeah, sure. Um, so that's nothing to do with stars. They are still there, still <laughs> shining. Um, that's to do with our eyes. Um, so the way the human eye works is very clever and it's sort of as efficient as it can be. Um, but if you if you want to be able to look at things in a well-lit room and be able to tell the difference between a slightly shadier part of a well-lit room and a more brightly lit part of a well-lit room, your eyes adapt to kind of that difference in intensity in light. And so if you then try and look at something that is quite dark but with some faint lights on it, so the night sky, um, you you kind of you can't see the difference between the dark night sky and the faint star. Um, so that's one element of why light pollution sort of makes it harder to see stars, which is that your eyes adapt to the sort of ambient light around you. Um, and so that's why if you want to see stars in a dark place, you need to kind of use a, a red torch or um, don't use a torch at all and sort of let your eyes adjust to the dark. Um, so that's why inside all of our telescopes, um, we have red lighting. We don't have sort of bright white lights because and you'd ruin your night vision every time you had to adjust the telescope. Um, the other thing is that when there is um, sort of just like light around, so street lights in a city, um, that light can sort of reflect off clouds in the atmosphere and just kind of generally, so if you've ever been driving into a city at night, you might see a sort of orange glow above the city in the sky. And that's all the lights from the city um, sort of reflecting off clouds in the sky. And that can make it really hard to see any stars as well if the sky itself that you're looking at is kind of slightly light then it's going to be very very hard to see anything that's about the same brightness as the sky and um, so you can only see stars when they're brighter than the sky behind them um, it's basically like trying to see a star like during daytime i mean the stars are there now i can't see them because the sky itself like the air is, is much brighter than the stars so well, my eyes are adjusted to whatever is the brightness of the, of, the, of the sky and I can't see the stars behind them. And it's just kind of a really, really uh, small difference. Um, yeah, there are actually like uh, some cities. So this is kind of a problem in many cities, like 
I, I used to live in a rural region as well, and now in, in a kind of larger city, you notice, of course, the difference that there are more lights around, so it's it's brighter in the sky, which means it's harder to see the stars. So usually you notice you see less stars. Um, that you know, see no stars, I think, is quite rare because there's some that are quite bright. Um, but yeah, in, in some places, it's a really big problem. And I think many cities these days try to consider, well, some cities at least, try to consider this problem by, um, you know, using street lights that only shine down and not like in all direction or uh, using other ways to make sure that not too much light escapes kind of into the sky um which is which is nice um <laughs> and it, of course like if you want to do extra like kind of science with astronomy like you want to do observations for example from an observatory uh, you have to make sure to build it somewhere where there are no um bright lights in nearby um so there are some cities i think in the us where there were observatories that had problems now and that try to reduce light pollution just because otherwise they can't do any science they can't do good observations because it's just too bright in the sky um yeah similar problem mm -hmm. i guess with with satellites uh, when where there are too many satellites in the sky and they're too bright uh, we might have difficulties um doing good observations ah we mm -hmm. got a select <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't plan this at all how oh, do you yeah. see the amount of satellites uh, being sent up to a hacked astronomy in the future, e.g. the SpaceX Starlink program. Uh, do you want to expand this? Um, yes, well, I can say what I know. Um, so if anyone's not aware, the SpaceX Starlink is the idea of sending up sort of trains of satellites. So you have sort of a long string of satellites in the sky, sort of all following the same path. Um, and that's really good for getting kind of really good internet coverage on the ground. Um, so good sort of communications. So satellites are quite often used for communications as well as for observing. Um, and the more satellites you have, provided they know not to run into each other, the sort of better communications coverage you get. But the problem with, or the problem that some astronomers have with the Starlink program is that the Starlink satellites are quite shiny um, and there's an awful lot of them. And so if you've sort of pointed your very expensive, very sensitive telescope at a very dark part of the sky to look at a very, very distant object. And then just as you get your time to look at that object, a sort of train of very shiny satellites passes in front of the screen, then you've got pictures of very shiny satellites and you've wasted your telescope time. Um, so there is, that's the kind of specific problem with Starlink that is hopefully being fixed by sort of making the satellites not so reflective. Um, the other problem is that the space around Earth where we can put satellites is finite. And we've been sending stuff up there for a very long time. And some of that stuff we still have control of. So a lot of satellites have rockets so they can adjust their course. So they stay in the right orbit. Um, but satellites reach the end of their life and maybe they run out of fuel or maybe they break while they're up there or there's sort of just junk in space from when we sent up rockets and bits of those rockets came off while the rocket was splitting off into its stages. And so we've gradually been filling space with stuff. And the more stuff you have there, the more likely you are to sort of accidentally hit something in space. And that's a big problem as well. Um, so there's impacts on astronomy, not just from things getting in the way of your telescopes, but also maybe things hitting your very expensive, very sensitive satellites, or hitting the ISS, which we don't want to do because we like that to be in one piece. Yes, yes. Although I have to like maybe give some, some credit to, to SpaceX here. Uh, they have been working on, the, on their satellites, so they have been doing various things, I think, covering the like, dark paint or putting kind of sun um, protectors over them to make sure they don't get lit by the sun so strongly. Um, so they are like less disturbing for observations of the sun, of the night sky, um, and I think they're also quite low in orbit, so they will like uh, slow down with with air resistance and then fall to the ground. Or uh, I think they are, will burn in the atmosphere. Well, like like um, well, I, <laughs> I guess you wouldn't call them meteorites, but just satellites that fly to the atmosphere. Anyway, they will disappear over over the years, and then we'll be, we'll have the kind of better ones, the, the less shiny ones remaining. So that would be. Uh, nice. Okay, so um, I think that's yeah, that's all. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, all the questions. Uh, thank you, Kat, for being here and answering <laughs> so many things. Um, 
if you want to see more uh, astronomy content from this channel, I think there's a book club starting again tomorrow, if I see this correctly. Tomorrow at 4.30. Uh, great. Drop Otherwise, to we'll... the universe. A job secret to key to the universe. I heard this book is supposed to be very good. Um, we'll be here again in probably two weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, again, Monday, same time. Uh, and then, uh, until then, um, see you.